Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Vetna Entrepreneur Track. Uh, this is our second class of the session, and we will be hanging out today with a professor from Cornell University by the name of Neil Tarallo. He will be talking about uh, will my ideas work and the feasibility of some of your projects. Uh, feel free if you are watching live through the event or through YouTube to post any questions or comments or if you'd like to come hang out live I can send you the invite and uh, you can come talk to Neil uh, you know, face to face so just about. But uh, otherwise I'm going to hand it off to Neil to introduce himself and get started here. So uh, thank you for being here today Neil. Hi Jim, thanks very much. Hello everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Neil Tarallo. I'm the Academic Director for Hospitality and Entrepreneurship at the Cornell University School of Hotel Administration. And uh, we have a couple of slides that we'll put up, uh, unfortunately more than a couple. But uh, I would encourage you uh, to interrupt as we go along and ask questions. Matter of fact, uh, let me change that. Instead of encourage, I would beg you to do that so that we don't have to watch all my slides. Um, but we'll go through those and we'll use those uh, kind of as a framework for us to um, have some guidelines uh, about what we're going to talk about and how we're going to talk about it. So uh, our discussion today is about evaluating your business ideas and also testing their feasibility. Two distinctly different things or parts of the process, um, but um, something that I, I think is uh, worth talking about at the same time. And I think when we discuss it, it's really important that we just kind of review what we mean by entrepreneurship and what entrepreneurs really should be thinking about because I think that provides the foundation for this discussion. And uh, we have two, um, two uh, definitions of entrepreneurship that we'll use. Sorry, I'm just getting the chat up here. Um, one uh, which is on the screen right now, entrepreneurship is the process of creating value by bringing together a unique package of resources to exploit an opportunity. So there's a couple things that we want to think about. One is that entrepreneurship is a process. It's not just this thing that happens. Lightning doesn't strike, although some folks seem to think it does. Um, it's a process. And because it's a process, we can manage it. Uh, we can break it up into steps. And we'll talk about some of those steps in a minute, but some of those steps are thinking about how we determine whether an idea is actually a good idea to, to, to launch a business around, and also understanding the feasibility of what we're thinking about. Um, but always we're creating value. We want to be thinking about that all the time. I think that's the basis for um, is my idea a good idea or not, is, is what value are we creating for our customers. Um, and the rest of the definition by bringing together a unique package of, of resources. Um, the fact that it's unique simply means we're different than our competition. We're offering our customers something more than they can get down the street or um, these days uh, on the other side of the country via the internet. Um, and we're, we're exploiting an opportunity. So is our idea really an opportunity is what we're going to be talking about here in just a minute. Um, next slide for me, Jim. Is there something, Jim, that shows uh, who's on and how many people are on on my screen? Uh, not on your screen, but I have a. I can see who's viewing, like a, how many number of people are viewing. And if somebody comes in live to the Hangout, they'll be down on the bottom here with us. OK, so you'll be able to see that. I'll be able yep. to see it. And if, if there's any questions coming in from YouTube or from Google+, Plus, I'll post them in the chat, and you'll be able to see that. Terrific. Um, so the, the second definition, which um, I like a lot, is the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently under our control. Um, and, and really, this is the fundamental mindset that all uh, entrepreneurs should have. It's that we first evaluate the opportunity, um, and then we think about the resources we need. And that's exactly the way we've designed this presentation this afternoon, is that we're going to talk about the idea, um, can we turn that idea into an opportunity? That's the first thing we determine. The second thing we'll worry about is um, resources that we need to, to uh, control in order to make that happen. And, and really, as you'll see shortly, that, that the resources are even farther down the list. Next slide, for Jim, please. So it can be broken down into steps or stages. The process can. It can be managed. It's an ongoing thing. It happens all the time. It happens forever. This process never stops um, as you are managing and running your business. Um, and it applies in all organizations regardless of size or shape. 
Um, uh, everybody has this process going on. All organizations do. The the kind of the the catch twenty two is as organizations organizations grow larger and larger, um, turning into large corporations. Can we keep an entrepreneurial mindset alive and well in our organization? Um, and we, we think about that when we think about corporate entrepreneurship. Next slide, Jim. Um, so we want to be creating value. And, and one of the things I want to be sure that I communicate well in this session is that we always want to be thinking about that. Um, understanding value and understanding how our customers perceive value um, is important to us to, to stay, um, I'm going to say fresh, uh, so that we are continually meeting our customers' expectations and giving them reason to continue to do business with us. And you have to move beyond invention. Inventions are wonderful things. Um, but if you can't move beyond the invention, then all you have is one product. And there are very few companies in the world, not actually that I can name, uh, that have been around for a long time based on one product. So entrepreneurship is not about invention. Um, entrepreneurship is about monetizing that invention and creating uh, a value proposition that is of interest to a large enough number of customers. A lot of times, actually, entrepreneurs are not, in, are not actually the inventors. And I think uh, great entrepreneurship occurs when individuals just see different things that are happening around them and bring those different pieces together to create an opportunity that nobody else has thought about before. And finally, uh, your, your concept has to be market-centered. I call this a market-driven opportunity. That's what we want to be defining when we think about is our idea a good one or not. And a market-driven opportunity very simply means are there enough customers to base a business on? Are there enough people who want to do business with me, who want to buy my product or engage in my, with my service um, in order to sustain a, to sustain a business? And you know, a lot of folks ask me over time, and, and the students that I work with here at Cornell will ask me what I think about their concept. What, what do I think about their idea or this um, opportunity that they they devised? And my answer is always the same. It really doesn't matter what I think about it, and and frankly, it doesn't matter what you, um, the aspiring entrepreneur, thinks about it. It's really what do the customers think about it? What does our market think about it? And if we have a significant market-driven opportunity we will always be able to get the resources that we need to launch the business. That's why resources are much lower on the list than opportunities, because the opportunity is what drives that. Next slide, Jim. So, you know, the, the, this analogy that's on the screen now, that it, it's a kaleidoscope thinking, um, really refers to the unique package in the, in the first definition we use. And if you think about a kaleidoscope where people, you know, put this thing up to their eye, and they uh, turn the dials around and these different pieces fall into place to create a different design and a different um, uh, set of variables come into play. That's kind of like what we're talking about here. Great entrepreneurs bring things together, bring these different pieces together to create a vision and a, and a company around it. Next slide. So it's an opportunity-driven behavior, and, and, I, and I hope I'm impressing that upon you. Um, to be great entrepreneurs, we need to understand that our behavior is driven by opportunity. It is not constrained by resources. So I always get frustrated when I'm working with individuals who will uh, go down a path thinking about opportunity but stop because they say um, we'll never be able to get money for this or we won't be able to get uh, enough people to, to employ in the job. Uh, we won't be able to get whatever resource it is they're concerned about not getting. And the, the fact is that you will get it if your opportunity is significant enough. So um, it's always about the opportunity. It's very um, infrequently about the dollars that go along with it. Uh, the opportunity brings the dollars with it. Next slide. So it's a process. Okay, We talked about that a little bit. Um, first, we identify an opportunity. And we're going to talk just a minute about bringing an idea into an opportunity. Um, the second is to develop a business concept around that opportunity. So how are we monetizing this? Are we actually going to be able to sell our product or service and make money with it? Third step is <coughs> excuse me, to assess the resources that you need. And the fourth step is to acquire those recesses, uh, those resources, excuse me. Look how far down the list acquiring resources are. 
it's fourth on the list out of six. Um, uh, so there are other things that are much more important for us to be thinking about rather than those resources. Fifth is implement, and the sixth uh, we call manage and harvest. Manage if we're going to run an ongoing business, harvest if we're going to run a business that will someday be spun off into a public company or acquired by a larger uh, entity. Any questions out there on anything we've talked about so far? Jim, you can change this. Oh, great. Thank you. So when we think about opportunity, we want to really be thinking about problems that we can identify in a marketplace. So as I'm thinking about an idea and what, what whether an idea I have is a good idea or not, um, I will try to associate it with problems that I see in a marketplace. Wherever there are problems that I can find a solution to and monetize, uh, I have a good solid opportunity. And then it's just a matter of understanding the feasibility of that opportunity in terms of how many people might be interested in pursuing that. So wherever you see problems, or we also say pain in a marketplace, we will also find opportunity. Next slide, Jim. <clears throat> um, so there's a lot of uh, different ways, and there are many different places that we can find problems. Um, and uh, as you as you go along that, you can uh, or thinking about that, you kind of raise your uh, awareness of what's going on around you. But by challenging existing assumptions about what is normal and what is not normal, often we can find problems. Um, by looking for patterns or trends, trends are one of my favorite ways of finding opportunities. See how things are moving along. See if you can stay ahead of it um, and see an opportunity with something that's happening there. Um, especially with changes in rules and laws and regulations, um, there are always opportunities available. Um, and then research that, that's based on customer needs um, is also a great way to discover opportunity. Where, where customers are having a, a need that is not met, um, we can often see an opportunity to launch a business to meet those needs. And then it's a matter of continuing to find ways to meet customers' needs uh, once we've, we've established that. Next slide. And if you think about trends that we see, you know, the population in the United States is, is aging, meaning that a larger number of people who live in the United States are becoming older and older. Um, we also know that those uh, aging, that, that aging population has more discretionary income, um, is healthier, is more active as they get older. So this creates opportunity for us. There are things that we can do, and you can see that happening all around the country right now as we start to see more and more opportunities for our, for our seniors in the, in the marketplace and in our population. Um, different uses of energy, um, uh, another uh, changing trend, single mothers, um, growing, growing trend, and how single mothers are dealing with and, and having to face raising children on their own or with only a little bit of help. Um, time becomes a big factor there. So thinking about some of those things, I'm not going to go through the whole list here, but you can see and you can kind of get um, get the idea of it. So, so where do we see those things? Next slide, Jim. Um, is is uh, they're happening all around us? Um, rule changes. Whenever some, a rule changes, there's an opportunity that's going to arise in some way, shape, or form. Um, as demographics change, people's needs will change along with them. Um, markets that are poorly served. I mean, Starbucks is such a wonderful example of this. Um, here was this entire market for coffee that was really not served very well. And look at all the competition that's come into this marketplace, the, the, this coffee marketplace, um, since Starbucks has been on, to just give you an idea of how big that gap was. And then think about how long that gap existed. So Starbucks, uh, yes, was at the right place at the right time, but they had the right concept, they understood their market, and they fill the hole that, that uh, was not being served. Um, social trends uh, continuing to change. Um, there are always new customers to market and new things happening, so we can be looking at different uh, different things uh, coming up through through those through that lens, I guess I would say. Um, next slide. Often one of the, the the great ways to think about whether opportunity is is good or not is to think about. Um, what makes something a good opportunity, or when it would not actually, I should say, be a, a good opportunity. And, and all of us who teach entrepreneurship use this example of, of building a better mousetrap. 
Um, the fact of the matter is that many, many people have tried to build better mousetraps. Um, but there really isn't a need. This simple device that we have, <coughs> excuse me, and that served uh, this market so well for so many years, is still meeting all the needs of everybody who are, are using it. And if you think about the other variations from the old, um, for lack of a better word, I call it a guillotine mousetrap, the spring rotor mousetrap, you know, the sticky paper, the catch them live in a box, um, the, the, the sales nationally of the old-fashioned uh, traditional mousetrap continue to outpace everything by a long shot. So if there's not really a market need, then, then we don't have an opportunity. Um, if customers are not dissatisfied with, with a particular product or service within a market, there's no reason to try to come up with something else. And customer loyalty is something also that is, is interesting and, and something we need to be thinking about. If there is strong customer loyalty in the marketplace, um, it, is, it is difficult for you to, to move into that market. So it may not be a great opportunity if there are very strong loyalties to competitors or to people that you'll be competing with. Um, what are the switching costs? Uh, this is, is very prevalent in softwares, particularly databases and data management softwares, where in order to move into a new software program, I may have to rekey thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of files, of, dust, uh, of, uh, of data files. Um, when when uh, uh, costs to switch are very, very high, it's probably not a good idea to move into that space. Look at competition, see what's going uh, on around you. If, there, if it's very easy for somebody to come into a marketplace as well behind you, then that's not necessarily a good opportunity because it's hard to defend your position in the marketplace. And then understanding what your customers value, I think, is an important part of that. And that's what that last bullet addresses. Um, if, if customers are not valuing uh, or, or not finding monetary value, in other words, they're willing to compensate you for the value that you can provide, um, then it may not be a good uh, a good thing to do. If you have to uh, incur large costs to create a quality that is acceptable to the customers, but, but, but that they're not willing to pay for, then you don't have a good opportunity. Next slide. So as you think about your problem and your solution, think about the next best alternative. You know, what's the next best thing that, that can happen? Um, and, and what's the, the, the natural progression, maybe, from a technology um, one iteration to the next? Um, what's the next logical thing to have happen? Sometimes there's opportunity in that as well. Next slide, Jim. So do we have an idea or do we have a business concept? And I think really the difference um, is is can we be specific in how we are creating value and can we understand whether that value that we are creating is recognized by the marketplace. Um, it's more than simply here's something new and we have to get past that. This is what we talked about earlier with getting past invention. Just because something is new and different um, um, uh, doesn't necessarily make it a, a great uh, a great opportunity. So I see some chats coming up here. Um, question from there's no name there. I have an opportunity to bid and have no resources. An opportunity to bid, Patrick Kelly. I don't know what you mean by an opportunity to bid and have no resources, Patrick. Um, maybe you could tell me a little bit more about that. Um, Jeanette. Jeanette, do I see you on the screen? I think no? so. That's you? That's me. Hi. She got red hair? She does. Yes, okay, good. Great. Bueno. So could you ask me what I think of uh, Indiegogo versus Kickstarter? Yes. You know, I, I haven't spent a great deal of time on either with either of those, uh, those, those uh, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding sites. Okay. But my understanding is um, th they have a different premise in how they operate, and I'll just confuse the two. So uh, what, I, what I would tell you is to be careful about what their mission is, what they're trying to accomplish with their particular um, concept. I don't okay. have any specific feeling for either one of them. Okay. 
Okay. But Thank you. Crowdsourcing is a way that we raise money. Crowdfunding is a way that we raise money, and it's becoming more and more popular. No question about that. Are there other chats there that I'm missing? Doesn't look like it. That's it for now, Neil. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Oops. Thanks, Jeanette. Thank you. Um, so, next slide. So, um, continuing on on the, the on the, the thought of uh, moving an idea into uh, into an opportunity, um, different ways to think about that is, is putting things together that have not been put together before, um, combining things in a way that nobody else has combined them before. Think about um, the way Starbucks sells coffee. Starbucks is a great example of these kinds of things. They put together. How, how coffee is retailed in, in the United States in a different way than anybody else has. Next slide. So concepts that have good potential to become great opportunities um, clearly show benefit to a market, to a, to a, a group of customers. Um, there is potential for profit, um, reason to believe that, uh, well, people have a reason to believe that, that it will work and that there's value in what it does. And how it operates. Sorry, I just had my notes here shut down. Um, uh, particularly if you can lead to other products as well, that's something that we want to be thinking about if you have an invention or if you're starting with something new. Um, those are things that provide good opportunities. Next slide. Uh, and the progression that we really see happening here is we have this idea, we turn it into an opportunity, we've identified that. Um, we, we, we create specifically uh, an understanding of what the product or service is that we're going to be offering, um, create a con concept to go along with it, and then a business model. And in very simple terms, the business model is how are we going to make money? What are we going to do um, to, to uh, actually bring that money into our, into our company? So, are we selling something, buying something, reselling it, and taking money to the bank? That's a business model. Um, and we want to be thinking about that and understanding clearly what our business model is. The simpler the business model, the better off we are. Um, and then finally, the business plan. And I'm a big advocate of business plans, particularly for new entrepreneurs. But oh. the reason is um, Jeanette just sighed heavily. You don't like <laughs> business plans, Jeanette. Um, business plans are a lot of work, I admit that. The, the, the value that I see in business plans is not so much this um, final written product that we have, this paper or this booklet that we have at, at the end of the day. Um, but um, it's really the process that we go through in writing that business plan that has the most value. Writing a business plan forces us to think about our market, our customers. Um, and um, also to think about the financial feasibility of what we're doing. It helps us communicate our, our, our ideas to other people, and it helps us understand our operations and make sure that everything will work as we think it will. So I'm going to back up a little bit and go through these again. Next slide. Sorry, I'm just reading over some of the stuff that's come up. Um, so a, a, a good business model uh, provides your customer with a product or service, and, and it, it, we're clear about what that product or service is. Um, it charges more than it costs us. And as part of the business plan and writing the business plan, that's one of the things that you should be exploring. Um, what does something really cost us? If we're reselling golf balls, um, the, the fact that we buy a golf ball for a dollar and sell it for two dollars does not mean we make one dollar on it. Um, there are fixed costs, overhead that, that's involved with that. And one mistake that, that entrepreneurs make most often is not having a good understanding of those fixed costs. Um, and that will cause uh, a lot of problems for you with cash flow as we go along. <clears throat> Distinguish yourself from competitors. Um, how are you differentiating yourself? And then what do you want to get out of this? What's your return on your investment? And is this a business that is sustainable? Will it be able to, to grow um, and to, and to uh, survive on its own for years to come? Um, 
So we want to be able to think about how we create value. Next slide, Jim. And um, some of the questions that you think about yourself, uh, you, you want to be thinking about your company is how will you create value and for whom will you create value? Um, what's your source of advantage over your customers um, as part of, of, the, of that and where does that value proposition really fit in? Um, how will you differentiate yourself? We already talked about these last couple of things. How will you make money? And then also I think it's really important that we have an understanding of our own personal goals in this and, and what we want to accomplish. How much time do you want to spend with this business? Um, what is the scope of what you want to accomplish and what you want to do here? Um, and uh, you know how big do you want this company to be? Do you want it to be this huge company, or do you want it to be something small that you can manage a little bit more closely on your own? Next slide, Jim. So when we think about creating value, we want to think about what the product or service is, and specifically if there's more than one. What are the different products or services that we're all offering, and who's interested in them? Who's going to be making them or creating them? Is it me or is it somebody else? And how are we delivering those things? In each of those steps, in each one of those things, you should be thinking about. You should be thinking about um, how you might create value um, along the way. And then finally, in the, the next slide, Jim, is for whom are you commuting? Uh, are you creating value? Is it for consumers? Is it for businesses? Um, where is that location in the value chain where you're creating value? And what's the scope ge geographically of what you're doing? Um, are these discrete transactions, which means they happen one at a time, or are they ongoing relationships? Ongoing relationships always create value for customers and gives you a much more solid uh, foothold in the um, in the marketplace. So um, that's what I have right now on the whole concept and the whole notion of, of an idea. Anybody have any questions about that? Anybody want to share any of their own ideas before we start talking about feasibility? Um, Deanna is asking, are all these elements to be addressed in the business plan? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, you know, what we're talking about here today, in my mind, is really a small part, not a small part, it is a part of the business plan. And um, the business plan, as you go through that, incorporates this thought process. It's, it's whether we really do have a good opportunity. And, and one of the things that I look for when I read business plans and as I vet business plans <clears throat> for, for different uh, uh, organizations is can I identify a problem that this company is solving in a marketplace? Can I identify pain that this company is alleviating for customer, alleviating for customers? If I can't, um, I am concerned about whether this is a viable opportunity, and that's the very first thing I look for when I read a business plan. So you should ask yourself that question, and don't be bashful about putting that in your in your business plan. I like reading right smack dab in the in the first paragraph of the executive summary, and or the first paragraph of the description of the company. This company solves this problem, and we solve this problem by doing X, Y, and Z, and we're going to make money this way. Um, uh, be very direct about it, and use use words very similar to what I'm using as I articulate that. That those are kind of hot buttons for investors, for bankers, for people who might be interested in your in your company um, getting off the ground and getting it started. So to, so to answer Deanna's question, I think I did, and you all, um, Deanna, if you want to turn your mic on, and if there's any follow-up to that or anything else, feel free to. So Jeanette, you have a phobia of business plans? Um, don't be afraid. That's what I always say. I'm going to turn uh, my mic on. There you go. I, okay. I, um, have, you, have you participated in any of the EBV programs or any of the EBV family programs? Um, not recently. I sat in on the very first program. This one really piqued my interest. <clears throat> I purchased a company that creates a therapeutic game. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Sure. 
So, so let me uh, let me say this. Um, and and what I do with my students is I require them to tell me about their company in three sentences or less. I can do that. And uh, because we're just starting out, I'll give you two extra. We'll say five sentences or less. Okay. So we're, tell uh, me what you do in five sentences or less, and I'm going to be listening for a problem that you're solving or pain that you're alleviating, not necessarily physical pain, but, but pain that you're alleviating in a marketplace. Go ahead. Okay. We create medical and therapeutic games that deal with uh, physical therapy and also behavioral therapy for adults and children. Outstanding. That's great. So um, you've acquired the company and there is no business plan in existence or you would like to start no. writing a business plan about, the, about it? Um, it's it's this game is our bread and butter so we can launch off of this game it's not a great income maker and also we want to expand you're doing fine I can hear you okay I keep hearing feedback okay. but <clears throat> but um, and and so um, what's happening is that we're taking this board game and we're going to create other board games but we also create digital games where we're iPhone developers, we're um, iPad developers, and I come from, I'm another university person. I taught at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I taught game design, and I have a passion for having games that make people's lives better, and that's what we're all about. And I specifically want to focus in the niche of the medical and therapeutic counseling communities and even expand to the point where we have joined in a development of or partnership with companies that create motion devices for games. So if you're working on an orthopedic issue, um, our programs would help someone work through the physical therapy in between visits. Okay. That's great. So um, you acquired the business from somebody else. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. And uh, how long was the business running before you purchased it? Um, many years. The games, we acquired an inventory of 3,000 games, and they were last printed in 1986. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So um, you could certainly um, uh, begin writing a business plan. There's no question about that. And in some ways, it's a little bit easier if you have an existing business in that you have some historical data to use. Um, really the, the important thing, and, and the really important thing too, and I, I don't feel like I communicated it very well in this first part of the discussion, um, is to understand that whole concept of market-driven opportunity. So the, the definition of market uh, for me is one word, it's customers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the number of customers that I, I can identify increases the size of the market that I have. Um, peak customers are people who, who have in some way, shape, or form indicated that they like my product or service and they want to engage me um, as a, as a, in that role as a customer. Um, so the, the bulk of the business plan for me is understanding who customers are and doing the research that's necessary to prove that they're out there and that they're out there in large enough numbers to support our business. So uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Surveys are one way you could do that. Um, focus groups are another way that you could do that. Um, there are different types of uh, very simple anthropological research that can support that as well, um, which is, is simply uh, a, a big word for observing people um, and, and watching behavior and seeing how people behave in a particular area or situation and, and how that might work. Um, so. Um, that's really the, the, the bulk of what you want to be doing and, and part of the growth proposition for you then is to understand where there are problems that you can solve by creating games or by taking some of these older games maybe and modifying them a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Any other questions, anybody, or anything that's kind of nagging in the back of your head that you didn't feel like I did a very good job on? Don't force me to go back to the PowerPoint slides. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't force you to. Uh, okay. I'll do the same thing. I've, I've been on a few of these, and I feel like I'm saying the same thing a lot, but I'm talking to a different person. So, 
I'm starting a multimedia education company, and our first program we're going to run this summer is going to be called Vet Out, and it's going to help veterans with their placement into their college math. We've got about we found at our college we've got about 86 percent of veterans placing into developmental math and that is costing them a great deal of time and money and we want to help remedy that okay and I'm sorry can I ask your name my name is Larry Larry thanks Larry I'm Neil um, so Larry if I could I'll just uh, I'll give you some words if you don't mind first um, and, and the first thing is articulate the problem that you're solving I think that your concept is really very interesting and and what what led you to think of this idea well, I am the, um, I'm, the, I'm the first stop for our veterans when they come to my school. I'm a veteran myself, and so they come see me and they talk to me, and I, I mean, everyone I talk to, and I'm a math teacher too, so that's one of my first questions always, what math class you're taking. Okay. And, and I mean, nine times out of ten, it is, they're in developmental math, and that's costing them a great deal of time and money, and I want to help. It's adding additional time on their degree. It's turning a two-year degree into a three-year degree, a, a four-year degree into a five-year degree. And I want to help remedy that. Solid. So how do we demonstrate that there are enough people out there, enough veterans out there, that are in need of this service? Well, as I said, I, we did. It's hard to find research on this. So we did the research at my school, and we found that 86 percent. We had about 200. Uh, we had about 200 people, 200 veterans who have come to our school, to my little community college out in Frederick, Maryland, in the past two years. That's all we could go back was two years. Yeah. And out of those 200, 86 percent were placing into a developmental math course. And so I'm, and I, and I'm assuming that that number is going to be similar nationwide. That's that's huge. That's very yeah. large. So, um, part of being of writing an effective business plan, and, and we all know that business plans, or we should all come to an understanding that everybody knows that business plans are nothing more than your best guess, um, and we all get that. Uh, a lot of times, you're just not going to be able to find facts, and we're going to be predicting or um, or, or trying to understand uh, how things are happening. And what's important is that those guesses that we make, those premises that we write about in our business plan are supported by fact. So Larry, what I would suggest that you do is just take a little time and maybe make contact with a couple of uh, a couple of a couple three, four, ten um, uh, institutions similar to yours that are um, far enough away across the country but serving the same kind of a uh, veteran population and ask them what their experience is with veterans coming in. Very simple research to do, but if you were to tell me that, hey, I got this idea this way, and this is what I found in my institution, so I went and talked to nine other institutions across the United States, and across all ten of our, of our colleges, we find that 83% of the veterans coming into community colleges are having to go into remedial or develop, developmental math uh, programs and it's costing them money and it's costing them time. We think we can solve this problem for them. Holy cow! I'm really excited to read this business plan now because you've really got something compelling for me to think about. And and it's also a way for you to to um, determine that you really do have uh, an opportunity here, and it's just not an idea that you have based on an experience that you have. So we're taking that next step down the line into into that progression. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Good. Um, so, so I would work that. I think you have a, a great, uh, a great opportunity there, and then you certainly can uh, alleviate some pain that's in the marketplace by doing that. Good for you. And, and you know, the other part about writing this business plan and going through this process is that we develop more confidence ourselves in what it is that we're doing, because as we talk to people, other people see that we have a good idea and they'll say, hey, that's a great idea. When you start this, when you get ready to do this, Larry, let me know. We'll partner with you or we'll do this or we'll buy this service from you or whatever it is that your business model becomes. Um, we gain confidence in what we're doing ourselves. So we get a stronger um, step as we as we move forward with it. Uh, I see in the chat there that, that's talking about number of events on the GL top bill. I think it is published. Yeah. 
Did I help, Larry? Did that, did that uh, answer a question for you? Yes, yes, that could help. And, and, and another thing that I'm I'm concerned about. I mean, right now I'm I'm going to do this for free. It's uh, it's going to be a free service for our veterans. And uh, and just to give you an idea, I'd, I'd like to elaborate on this. If sure. uh, as I'm hoping, what I can do is run this program. I'll do what you said there and contact more places, and I can run it and then show that it's working and that it's saving our veterans time and money. And in the same process, it's saving the VA time. And my I, my hope is potentially to get a contract or possibly a grant from the VA uh, to to be able to make a little bit of money with this idea, because I don't I, 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 think, I definitely don't want it to be a process where the veterans have to pay for it. Sure, I I, I understand that, and as a a long time participant with EBV I, and uh, and the IVMF, uh, I can appreciate wanting to do that for for a veteran population. Um, let me let me give you a, a, a teeny bit of advice, if you don't mind my two cents being thrown in there. It's difficult to run a organization, <coughs> excuse me, that we'll call a non for profit right now in your case, um, where you are entirely dependent on uh, grants and donations. Try as you're developing this to think about some source of revenue, something that you can do that will bring revenue in. That will support this other initiative that you want to that you want to move forward with, uh, and I don't have a good answer for you. I can tell you that in our community we have an organization that helps individuals who are physically and mentally handicapped um, mainstream into the workforce. Um, so they have this this non for profit um, uh, community minded mission that they're working on, but they support and pay for that mission by. Um, by somebody brought me some cough drops because I'm struggling with a cold here. Um, they support that by creating uh, small businesses that some of those folks who who are being mainstream use for training. So they'll take uh, the old style microfiche film and they'll digitize that, and they charge a fee to the businesses to do that. The proceeds from that business supports the other part of what they're doing in their non for profit. So what you want to be thinking about and what really motivates people to participate with you is if I were to say, Larry, here's a dollar, how much of this dollar actually goes to helping the veterans who need the math help? When you can start to tell me 70 cents, 80 cents, 90 cents of that dollar goes directly there, that's when I want to be participating with you. And it's kind of a, a chicken and egg thing. You know, once you have money that can help support your overhead, is what we're really talking about there. Um, more people will want to give you money to support your mission. And, and I think it's an important concept for you to try to, to get your head around. And if you can, think about ways that you can generate revenues that, that will, so that that will go towards the other. Okay. I have a partner, and both, both he and I are really good at creating learner modules, online learner modules, any kind of learner modules you want. Uh -huh. and, that, and that's, and that's a, a potential that I think is we could – even for businesses, you know, businesses when they hire somebody, they need to do some type of training. We can streamline that training. I know there's already companies that do this too, but uh, that that's another thing that I potentially think that we could get into. I think that's great, and and try to separate the two. You know, you 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 have a business model for each one of them, right? And as you grow and as you get big enough, it's the health of the of the for-profit entity that really will drive your non-for-profit mission. Okay, so I, I, I can do that. I can separate out because because my my LLC is is O Math, but this program we're talking about it's called Vet Out, yep. so I can separate those two. One as a non not for profit, and the Absolutely. other one is every major yeah. corporation in the country does that. Um, look at yeah. in my area, we have uh, Corning Glass. Corning Glass, a very successful company, has another uh, organization that is a sister organization called Corning Foundation. Corning Glass provides the, the foundation, the, the money for the foundation to do the good things that it does. So you can absolutely do that. Okay, thank you. I'll look into doing that then. My pleasure, my pleasure. Uh, Deanna, VWISE is um, a part of the uh, Institute for Veteran and Military Families um, educational offerings in entrepreneurship that is directed to women veterans. It's, it's just women veterans. That's the only qualification you need to have, or two qualifications, I should say. And um, I, I teach in the VWISE programs around the country. Um, 
very good programs. A lot of entrepreneurship learning um, happens along the way. Okay, anybody else going to save me like Larry did, or am I going to go back to these uh, nasty PowerPoint slides? Hey, Neil, I believe that VWISE is now open to uh, women military spouses as well. Oh, geez, thanks, Jim. I didn't so, know that. Thank you. Yeah. That's good to know. I didn't know that. So, yeah. Deanna, if you just go online and uh, Google uh, VWISE, it'll come up, guaranteed. And I'll post, I'll post the link to the page on the event, and it's in this chat room for those that are in the Hangout as well. Great. Will we be able to download the PowerPoint? Jim, that they're welcome to it. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, as long as Neil's good with it, I can post it uh, on the event as well. No, that's what we do these things for. I should give credit to some of the feasibility analysis part of the PowerPoint uh, comes from one of the textbooks I use from Prentice Hall, so we should say that so that they don't accuse me of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, stealing from them. Uh, okay, nothing addressed to me on the chat. That's great. Hey, Neil, Patrick, who had the question earlier, he just joined our Hangout. Okay. Um, Patrick, did you want to uh, further talk about your question about your bid? So, Patrick, you're saying I have a commercial business started. How do you recommend adding a federal division? Same LLC or another one. Patrick, can you tell me a little bit about your business? Do you have a mic on your uh, computer? Maybe not. Um, I guess I need some more information, and I, I always want to be careful to say that um, God invented lawyers and accountants for a reason, and that's so that I don't make mistakes. Um, uh, I always recommend that as we move forward in entrepreneurship and, and getting our businesses going, that we engage accountants and attorneys to help us make some of those decisions. Um, so uh, I would suggest that you think about that a little bit. But I'll, um, if you give me some more information, I'm happy to, to try to zero you in a little bit on it. Uh, VWISE is offered, Deanna, through uh, Institute for Veteran and Military Families which is part of Syracuse University. It's an institute on the Syracuse University campus. Um, but it is, it's not, it does, they don't only occur, in, as a matter of fact, VWISE does not occur at Syracuse University. It occurs around the country. I think our next one is in May in Chicago. But they go all over the country. We've been in Denver. We've been in uh, Tampa area. Uh, many different things. Yvette, I hope I see you at Chicago then, be wise. It's going to be fun. Um, okay, so the, the next step in what we do is, is the feasibility analysis. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Um, because Jim is going to make those slides available to everybody, I'm just going to kind of talk about this without using slides. So, Jim, if you want to take the slides down, I think that's fine. And uh, whenever they're posted, folks can access them. But um, feasibility occurs in a, in a couple of different ways. And anybody, stop me anytime you have any question at all, whether it relates to this issue or to this, this subject that we're talking about or not. But um, we want to be thinking about, let me just uh, get to my notes here so I make sure that I follow a, an intelligent path. Um, so we want to think about feasibility in a couple of different ways. And, and right away, when, when we say feasibility, our instinct is to think about finances. And while financial feasibility is certainly part of that, we want to try to break it down into some different areas, one of which is, um, is the product going to work in the first place? So um, are the gains that, that, that Deanna is proposing um, will help people in physical therapy or different types of therapy, will they in fact do what she thinks they're going to do? Um, so we want to make sure there's a feasibility. Got it. Um, uh, the second is how feasible are you compared to your competitors? Um, 
do, do you have an ability to have a competitive advantage over what else has been out there? Um, so uh, think about your competitors and try to understand what's going on along those lines. Uh, feasibility in terms of marketing. Are you going to be able to market? Can you identify marketing channels that you're going to use? How are you going to communicate with your customers? Um, and then the production. If you're actually manufacturing something, is it feasible to produce this? And is it feasible to produce this at a, at a level that you can then sell it for and make a profit on? Remember, we want to be thinking about not just the cost to produce something, but the cost for the overhead of the company as well. Uh, is it feasible uh, to finance this venture? Um, are there ways that we can get? Um, um, is, are there ways that we're going to be able to get money to start it? Um, we can talk about banks and banking in a little while, uh, if you like, or at any time really, if you like. Um, when we're talking about small businesses, like like we're talking about here, really things like venture capitalists and angel investors are not going to be a source of uh, financing for us. So where are we going to get that money from? Is it going to come out of our bank account? Do we have uh, uh, friends and family who might be able to uh, participate with us? How does that work? Um, people. Is it feasible to get the people that we need to make this happen? So those are some of the things that I think about when I think about feasibility. It's not just about the dollars. And it's more about, and, and we go back there um, to, the, to the very beginning of our discussion, it's more about are there customers? Is this feasible from the from the standpoint of are there people out there who want this product or service? And I, my students always laugh and they tell me that about half of the times when I ask a question in class, the answer is customers, because so much of what we do needs to focus on our customers. And when we lose that, when we lose that 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 focus, we lose our business. Um, if if you uh, if you think about Kodak, you know Eastman Kodak one of the largest companies in the world, still one of the, the, the most recognized brands in the world globally, is, is now bankrupt. And they're bankrupt very simply because they forgot to keep focusing on their customers. They forgot to listen to what it was their customers were interested in and valued. And they continued to push their own personal, as a company, perception of what they should be and what, what they should be uh, selling and, and producing for people. Um, when a company that big that's been around as long as uh, Eastern Kodak has can make a mistake like that. It, it uh, is, is a good lesson for all of us to be thinking about those things. So some of those things that we just talked about, I'm going to break them down into a even even into a smaller group um, in terms of what we want to be thinking about for feasibility. And uh, the first thing is a technical and market assessment of what we're doing. Okay, so I'm going to break this down to four things for us. Um, one is, do we have the technical expertise if we are a technical product uh, or, or a service that, um, that uh, focuses on technology um, to do what we need to do? Um, and, and again, uh, the market assessment part of this, which is the first thing that I always think about is, are there customers out there who find our opportunity valuable? Uh, because if there are not, then we do not have a company. And you can stop right there. You don't have to think about your feasibility in any other structure uh, or in any other way. Um, the second is cost assessment. So how much is this going to cost us to get off the ground? Can I finance that cost? Where am I going to get that money from? Um, and the, the fourth is uh, profitability. Can I be profitable running this business and, and, and uh, moving forward with this? If we can't be profitable, uh, and I'll determine profit for the sake of this conversation as both monetary profit and if we are a non-for-profit venture in terms of how many lives are we touching, how many people are we helping? Because if we're going to be working really hard and we're only helping a handful of people, there's got to be a better way to help them. So we kind of go back and, and rethink the feasibility of what we're doing. So again, just to repeat so, so that you can keep track, technical assessment, market assessment, cost assessment, and profitability assessment. Those are the four things that I think about when I think about the feasibility of my, of my uh, company. Jim, what's our timing look like? 
I got about five minutes left, Neil. That's all. Yeah. I'm having fun. I have to stop in five minutes. Well, that's uh, that's why you'll be back on Thursday. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Anybody? Any last minute questions? Uh, Patrick had a question in the chat up there. Uh, he kind of elaborated okay, on his question. You. I got you, Patrick. I have an IT franchise. Wrote a business plan for it. It started to grow legs. That's terrific. Uh, okay, I, got you, I got you, Patrick. I have an IT franchise. You recommend a separate plan and LLC for government reports. Okay, I understand. Um, franchise. No, I don't necessarily think in this case that you need a separate LLC. I can see no reason to do okay, that. I understand. Remember the uh, the reason we create these types of business for corporations, LLCs, and the like, is to protect us uh, in a liability sense and to address tax issues. Um, I don't think that changes either of those changes for you, whether you're working with a local government, a federal government, or even individual customers. Um, I don't see as that being an issue for you. Um, uh, I write a business plan for everything. So within, and, and honestly, uh, my business plan is boiled down to more of a feasibility analysis. Um, in that I, I simply address the market, the customers, uh, the financial aspect of it, and, and I, I try to quantify what I'm doing. Um, uh, I've, I've never been turned down for a loan. And the reason I've never been turned down for a loan is because I do that. Because I understand the language that bankers speak, and I understand what it is they're looking for, and um, I put that down on paper. So I do a feasibility analysis of what I want to do. As part of that, you know, if you could start thinking about or, or talking to um, federal customers and getting a feel for whether they'd be doing interested in doing business with you, I mean, I, I think that that's a great start for you. Purchase orders in hand are like money in the bank. Uh, purchase orders can be turned into cash very easily. So uh, the extent that you can start working along those lines, too, can help that. Um, but I, I think that's the way I would think about it anyway. But is, is that helpful that I answer your question? Good, good, okay. It, it does. I don't know if uh, what kind of feedback you have. Yeah, I appreciate I, I, it. I just don't have any resources to chase the government stuff right now. But I have opportunities coming down the pipe. So, why don't you go ahead and mute your mic again? There we go. So, when you tell me you have opportunities but no resources, um, I'll forgive you because you weren't uh, listening to the early part of this conversation, all right? But it's the opportunity that will get you the resources. So, when you say you have opportunities, um, what do you need for resources? If it's cash that you need, um, get the purchase order. And get yourself some time. And, and before you do that, go talk to your banker or go talk to somebody who buys uh, accounts. There are, there are people who, who buy companies who actually buy accounts. So they'll discount it and they'll work on it. If people is what you need, boy, in this day and age, people should be not so difficult to, to find. Um, if there's particular skills that you need, then you know, think about a training program that you can start working out uh, if those are the resources you're looking for. And I, I feel like I'm talking around it a little bit, Patrick, and I'm sorry because it, it, there's a lot of specifics that I'm missing. Um, but don't let the lack of resources stop you from pursuing an opportunity because it's the opportunity that will, that will get the resources for you. And, and if it's that you can't pay people, maybe you bring them in for a piece of the action. Maybe it's, you know what, I'm just starting out this federal division and I don't have the cash to pay you. But if you want to come and work, I'll give you 10% of everything that we bring in. I'm just picking random numbers there, so I'm, I'm not suggesting that's it. Okay? Um, Yvette, you had something I saw. Do you have a recommendation for feasibility studies for creative art business event planning? Where to research? Um, the best place to research, uh, there's two types of research that we talk about, and Jim's going to cut me off here in a minute. Um, two types of research we talk about, secondary research and primary research. Secondary research is research that other people conduct and publish that you can access. 
and primary research is research that you conduct yourself. So um, uh, secondary research, the best place for that is at your public library. They have access to databases that give credible information. Um, Google and other internet type searches uh, are not always good ways to find information because the internet is not necessarily a credible source. So while Google may be a terrific uh, search engine, the information that it gets you is not Google certified by any means. So you're relying on what other people post. You want to be careful of the internet in general. Um, why don't you, if you have time, event, um, come back and, uh, and bring this raise this question up again on Thursday, and I can go to a lot more detail on it. When we think about feasibility and, and we think about our market, research is a huge component of that. And maybe Thursday we can talk about that a little bit more because that will be a, a, a good a topic for discussion. Okay? All right. Thank you, Neil. Give me, give me the hook, huh? Yeah, we, uh, we've reached the 6 o'clock hour, so we, uh, we've been on for an hour. Uh, do you want to say anything else, Neil? Or? No, I look forward to chatting with everybody again on Thursday. I hope you're there, and uh, I hope this was valuable to you. Um, so please uh, join us, and, uh, and maybe we can move something forward for you uh, as we go along as well. Thanks a lot, Neil. We really appreciate you being here for us today. Uh, Thanks, everybody. I will make all the PowerPoint slides available on the event, and uh, Neil will be here with us again on Thursday to host the office hours, which will just be like an open conversation. So anybody that's been in today's Hangout or anybody that watches uh, this recording on YouTube, feel free to come on Thursday and post any ideas or any questions you might have for Neil. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for the uh, interaction, and we hope to see you on Thursday. Terrific. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.